Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Purdy Insurance. Visit Purdy Insurance on Market Street in Sunbury or visit online at purdyinsurance.com. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. Good afternoon, everybody. It is the Steve Jones Show on a national championship game day. News Radio 1070 WKOK. Back at Trillo here with you. Steve Jones will soon be coming to us from the Sunbury Motors studio. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Humble's Wharf. And today's show, as every Monday is, brought to you by our good friends at Purdy Insurance. Go to purdyinsurance.com or visit them at their office on Market Street in Sunbury. Man, what a big show we have here today. It was already big enough. We have all of our talk with the National Championship game coming up tonight at 8 o'clock on ESPN. Brad Nessler from the SEC on CBS. He's a broadcaster there for them, play-by-play. He'll be joining us at 3.35 today to give us some perspective on the game. Of course, he saw a lot of LSU this year, but he always has his eye on across college football. So that's really going to be an exciting interview. We have him coming up at 3.35 today to get ready for the national championship game tonight but before we get more into the game itself we got some big breaking news to talk about with the Astros cheating scandal as the Astros GM and manager AJ Hinch has been suspended for the 2020 season for the sign stealing investigation that they had MLB will be fining the Astros five million dollars as well and will take away their first and second round draft picks in the 2020 and 21 2021 draft so that's a pretty hefty punishment to begin with MLB has also said in a statement that if Lou now the GM or Hinch quote engage in any future material violations of MLB rules they will be placed on the league's permanently ineligible list and no players have been disciplined by the MLB in this investigation the only one that was in uh, part of the investigation was current Mets manager Carlos Beltran who was on the 2017 World Series winning team which I kind of call foul on. I get he's not a player anymore, but I still think he should be suspended for that and face punishment for that. So so obviously that's not going to happen there. Don't, that's probably the only thing I don't agree with with all the punishments handed down by the MLB. Other than that, I do agree with it. And the other piece of this puzzle that we're waiting on now is discipline for current Red Sox manager Alex Cora, and that's going to be coming and it's going to be harsh according to ESPN. Cora was on the Astros, was the Astros bench coach during the 2017 season and of course the Red Sox are now being investigated for their sign stealing issues in 2018 when they won the World Series so look at a couple of teams here that have been robbed by this obviously the 2017 to 2018 Dodgers because they lost both those World Series to those teams and the Yankees the Yankees lost the 2017 ALCS to the Astros they lost the 2018 ALDS to the Red Sox now, I'm not saying we need to go back and rewrite history and change who won those series, but it is important to point that out. And the fact that MLB came down the way they did, I think is commendable on their part. I just would like to have seen some suspension or at least some sort of punishment for Carlos Beltran. But we'll see what the Red Sox get now out of this, including their manager, Alex Cora. So we have plenty to talk about on that. We did reach out to USA Today's Bob Nightingale, who has been a friend of the show. He's joined us before. He's been all over this, too. So maybe we'll get a chance to talk to him either today or tomorrow. And also thought was interesting, too, about this is now current Phillies manager, Joe Girardi, who was, of course, the the Yankees manager in 2017, lost his job after the Yankees lost that Game 7 in the ALCS to the Astros. And he had some pretty interesting things to say to the media about this whole entire thing and he basically said he wasn't shocked they had put a lot of different things to try to combat certain things so they knew this going in and he thought they did a pretty good job of looking of how the Yankees were able to try to play around with that and deal with that as best as they could and of course it was out there to begin with anyway 
because he had former players even of, of the Astros even mentioning what they did behind the scenes. So this is just pretty telling, and, you're, and it's good to see the MLB and Rob Manfred come down as hard as they did. But for Alex Cora in particular, he's, not guilt, he's guilty not once but twice with this now, with two different teams. So I, his suspension should be more than a year in my opinion because it's been done twice. It should be at least two years, and he should get the same type of a threat from the MLB if he engages in any future violations of the MLB rules, then he should be put on the league's permanently ineligible list as well. But other than that, I agree with everything that the MLB has done. You've stripped him of high draft picks for the next two years, you've given him a pretty hefty fine, and you've suspended the GM and the manager for a full season. Now, one thing the MLB does need to do is make sure that they that Jeff Lutnow and A.J. Hinch do not have any contact whatsoever with the team next year, with the Astros next year, or else then this isn't as this isn't as quite big as it, it seems to be right now. They can't have any contact whatsoever, and I'm hoping that the MLB will do that, and I think they will do that based on what we've seen so far and how they've handed down these penalties. So we'll definitely well, talk about that like, when we'll get like, Steve's perspective. Like, yeah, the, here he is. The, the penalties are absolutely deserved in this. Uh, first of all, let's start with this. Jim Crane, the owner, by the way, was found to be completely exonerated in this. Completely. Which was, I, th- I thought, to be very, very important. Uh, that he had no knowledge of this whatsoever. Hinch, who's just been fired, and Jeff Luno, who's also been fired... All right. Uh, evidently, how much Luno, he knew enough. How about that? But if you read the report, guess who's in real, I mean, Hinch is out of a job and so is Luno. They're both done. Crane is that mad and should be. But if you read the report, you know what's in there? Because the next, the next group up is going to be the Red Sox, right? Alex Cora has got big trouble here. Big trouble. Uh, because according to the report, if you read it, it reads as if he is the mastermind of it. Because remember, he was the bench coach for the Astros during this 2017 season. He was the bench coach. And it says in the report that even though A.J. Hinch absolutely disapproved of this and on two different occasions broke the monitor in the dugout, because he was so mad about it. He didn't stop it. Thus, he loses his job. He was suspended. The original suspension was a year by Major League Baseball. Luna was a year by Major League Baseball. Crane was so mad about all this because, you know, Crane's out there defending everybody during the playoffs, and now he's so mad about it because he's found out the whole, you know, because evidently in the report is very specific that the owner of the Astros absolutely knew nothing and turned over everything. Couldn't have been more cooperative to get to the bottom of it. Well, now they get to the bottom of it, and when they do, they find out this. They suspend those two for a year. He fires them on the spot. But if you read the report, the guy in the report that has to be really worried about his job at this hour happens to be Alex Cora, the manager of the Red Sox. And, of course, the Red Sox are now accused of doing the same thing. Now, do you think Alex Cora, Steve, should get a harsher penalty than just a year suspension because he did this not one but two different times with two different teams? Well, you have to do an investigation of the Red Sox first. It doesn't right, mean you, yes. know, you have to you you can't you can't conclude even though the evidence appears strong in one direction. Remember, the only reason this came up about the Astros was Mike Fires blowing the whistle on them. Right. If Mike Fires doesn't blow the whistle on this whole thing, nobody thinks twice about it, right? Exactly right. Huh. So if they do find it, if they do find him guilty of it though, should he be suspended more than a year? I say yes. Might be. Might might be, but I think if he does, I think he'll lose his job. I mean, I agree. Now after seeing this situation, AJ Hinch, 
I mean, A.J. Hinch lost his job, and even though he disapproved of it, he didn't do anything to stop it. If you're talking about somebody who is, quote, the mastermind of it, which, it, which if you read this report, makes him out to be with the Astros, let alone the Red Sox. I mean, he goes from one organization to another organization, and now they're accused of doing the same thing. Uh, I'm, you know, if if there's anybody in Major League Baseball right now that should be really worried about what their future is in the game, it's going to be Alex Cora. Because this report did not paint him in any kind of possible positive light at all. Hinch was upset about it. Mad about it. Broke the monitor on two different occasions. They used you know, banging of the trash can in the dugout as ways of signaling what was going on. Hinch got furious about that. But what's the problem? The problem is he didn't do anything about it. So since he didn't do anything about it, he is the one that loses his job. Jeff Luno... The Astros general manager knew about it, didn't stop it, loses his job. They were both given the Sean Payton one-year suspension deal, like Sean Payton with the New Orleans Saints over uh, the incidents there, the bounties. Well, Payton not only survived, he continues to coach the New Orleans Saints. Hinch and Luno did not survive. They ended up getting both fired. And it's going to take some rehabilitation for each one of them, reputationally, to get themselves back into the game. Because they're forever going to be linked to this. For Alex Cora, this is going to be, for him, it's going to be interesting to see how the Red Sox, how the Red Sox right now treat it. I mean, the Red Sox may go out and they may be preemptive because of this. I don't know. But for Major League Baseball, let's give uh, Major League Baseball credit. They said they were going to come out with the the report and they were going to they were going to go after this. I think most people were like, huh, "Yeah, okay, sure you are. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, good for you. I'm sure you'll be. I'm sure you'll do the usual slap on the wrist and move on." Uh, wrong. They also fined the Astros five million, which is the maximum. They also have taken away two first round picks and two second round picks. So they should not have a first round pick in twenty or twenty one, or in twenty one, twenty or twenty one, a second round pick. So there's a, a lot of layers to this, and there are obviously other employees involved in this, and they are also in deep trouble with Jim Crane and the organization. Deep trouble. Oh boy. You always I always ask myself in situations like this where I just um where I look at stuff and say well, you just don't think you're good enough on your own to win? Uh, we'll take a break. Uh, Brad Nessler's on the show today, by the way. We will talk about the national championship game tonight. Our play-by-play call today. Oh, this was done by the suit, the Bill Cower thing. My goodness. Actually, in his defense, it was all my idea. Yeah, I mean, Tom Flores won two Super Bowls. He's not in. All right. Okay, we'll come back with more. I mean, I mean, seriously. I mean, come on. Kyle, how about Shanahan? 
Shanahan won two Super Bowls. Yeah, I agree. But, but, but the franchise never won one. It, it, it's interesting. It, it, uh, I, I'm happy for Coward. I'm happy for Johnson. They both deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. But there are other coaches that, no offense, did more. Suit doesn't like that, but <laughs> I, I know coaches that did more. And they both did great. They both deserve to be in, but so should some other people. We'll be back with more in a moment here on News Radio 1070 WKOK, brought to you by our good friends at Purdy Insurance. When it comes to car buying, there's the other guy's way, and then there's the SMC way. The other guys force you into a vehicle you really don't want. The Subway Motors way lets you take the time you need to browse, ask questions, and take the test drive and think on it. For over 100 years, the Merth family and all their employees have made your experience the most pleasant one you'll ever have. The other guys won't offer you the best price for your trade, no matter how much they say they will. The SMC way is their promise to provide you with the most money the market shows your vehicle is worth. The SMC way is to offer you all applications applicable factory rebates on new vehicles and generous discounts. Looking for a pre-owned vehicle? The SMC Way checks each vehicle in a 200-mile radius to determine the lowest price, then beat it. It's the lowest price promise, just part of the SMC Way. The choice is up to you. The other guy's way or the SMC Way. The SMC Way wins every time. Sunbury Motors Company in the North 4th Street Auto Plaza, Sunbury, and at sunburymotors.com. Selling more cars and satisfying more customers for over 100 years. Vintages of every color and flavor. Spirits and beer that are lively, full-body flavored, fruity, and more. Where can you experience all the subtle tastes and textures like these? At the 4th Annual Taste of the Town on Saturday, February 1st, 6 to 10 p.m. at the Bloomsburg Fairgrounds Industrial Arts Building. Sponsored by the Ronald McDonald House of Danville. Tickets are $40 in advance and $50 at the door. And include tastings, appetizers, complimentary wine glass, and live entertainment provided by Rattle and Wayward One. Enjoy tastings from Iron Vines Winery, Austin Hollow Winery, Boucher Vin- Yards, Staggering Unicorn, Eight Oaks Craft Distillery, Hazards Distillery, Five Smucks Winery, The Inn at Turkey Hill Brewery, The Cookie Dude, Lucy's Craft Catering, Philip Smoked Cheese, Utter Delights, Gourmet Hot Dogs, and so much more. Browse the vendors for additional fantastic items to purchase. Get your tickets online at rmhdanville.org or check out the Ronald McDonald House of Danville Facebook page. The Ronald McDonald House of Danville would like to thank Wise Markets, Geisinger, and Med Impact Healthcare Systems for sponsoring the Taste of the Town. The Ronald McDonald House of Danville would also like to thank Wise Markets for sponsoring this ad. Hey, babe, have you seen MacGyver? I think he's hiding because he knows we're going to the vet. He's already in the car! Ever since I started taking my dog, MacGyver, to Animal Care Hospital Lewisburg, he loves going to the vet. We walk in, there's Animal TV on for him, then the loving staff treats him like royalty for all of his checkups. I get all of his medications there, any of his tests done, and dental cleanings. You'll not find a more loving, compassionate veterinary office than Animal Care Hospital Lewisburg at myanimalcarehospital.com or on Facebook. They really mean it when they say that they love what they do. Hospital Drive, Lewisburg. Let's say you just bought a house. Bad news is, you're one step closer to becoming your parents. Soon, you'll have a separate fridge in the basement where extra groceries are exiled forever. Remember that frozen lasagna? Of course you don't. It's been down there since 2008. Good news is, it's easy to bundle home and auto through Progressive and save on your car insurance. Piece of cake. Behind the lasagna, it's very old. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company affiliates and other insurers. Discount not available in all states or situations. So where does this go from here? Well, it goes from here. Alex Cora is going to be sitting there right now as the manager of the Red Sox, who are now accused of doing the same thing. Because his his name is all over this report. His name is all over this report. And anytime your name is all over any report, that's not good. And we know the internal report where the suit's name is mentioned 25 times. I mean, he's he's Teflon. (laughs) What? He's the Teflon suit. Wetzel knows. Wetzel's in the building. Wetzel knows what I'm talking about. He's the Teflon suit. <laughs> Wetzel's just nodding his head. Yeah. <laughs> this report could be all over the place. Not, not him. He's all good. All right. 
Uh, but yeah, you're right. That's a way to come out swinging to get things going, isn't it? I mean, that. And then Hinch got fired. Uh, Hinch is in an interesting spot. Well, right now he's in no spot. But he's against it. He's mad about it. He's against it. He's mad about it. Doesn't do anything about it. And, you know, he, he breaks the monitor on two different occasions because he's so mad about it. And he still doesn't do anything about it. And so he's out of a job. Yeah, it's uh, and it's not the end of it because again, the guy that looks—if you read the report, the guy that's in trouble is Alex Corum. For nearly 100 years, Purdy Insurance has been your locally owned, family operated source for insurance products. With a staff of over 20 and partnerships with some of the industry's most trusted companies, Purdy has the experience and resources to get the job done. Whether you need personal home and auto or complex business insurance solutions, Purdy will help you navigate through the process. Call today at 570 286 5855. Or better yet, stop in their Sunbury office to see what Purdy Insurance can do for you. Taking your calls at 800-795-9565. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. Today's show brought to you by Purdy Insurance, Market Street in Sunbury. Go to purdyinsurance.com. And we're in the Sunbury Motors Studio, Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury, Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. And uh, there are certain people that you just say the name and automatically they think quote best in the business and Brad Nessler is absolutely one of them Brad great to have you back it's good to hear you on the other end hey my friend it's been a while how you been it's been too long, too long. It's all those S- it's all those SEC games you're doing. I, I don't get up, I don't get up in your part anymore. of the country anymore, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I watched uh, Joe Burrow warm up a few times in Ohio State, but he never got into a game I did. <laughs> so, That's so, a cool um, way to put it. I, you know, when we saw him start to come on last year in the second half of the season, and I thought, man, this kid's pretty good. And then uh, I saw him at the Manning Passing Academy in, in the summer down in Louisiana, and and talked to him, and his dad and his brother were down there too. So I had a time time to spend a little time with him, and and he said, uh, "You're gonna like our offense." And I go, "What are you talking about?" He said, "We're going to the spread." And I said, "Well, I watched your spring game. I didn't see that much of it." He said, "We didn't do much in spring." He said, "It's gonna be something special." And I looked at him and I said, "Yeah, right." LSU says that all the time, Joe. You know, and uh, <laughs> wow, lo and behold, little did I know. <laughs> and then when no, I, I saw it in, in action this year, as many times as I did, it's something special. And because obviously Joe Brady was here for two years as a grad assistant at Penn State when Penn State was implementing the right. spread here with Joe Moorhead. Uh, so what's the difference in the Joe Burrow that you saw a year ago that, by the way, was very good in 2018 yeah. to the Joe Burrow that was exceptional in 2019? He just gets it, Steve. I mean, he knew the offense. It was funny. Steve Emsner, the offensive coordinator, he and Brady put it all together, um, You know, said to me, we could have – uh, Joe could have run this offense last year, but we couldn't. He was talking about the coaches. So he was giving Joe more props than he was himself, you know. And uh, I just think the fact that it all came together with the receiving core they have, he's hes a really cerebral kid on top of being talented. Uh, and, you know, he knows where to go with the ball. I think 90% of the time he knows where he's going with it before the snap, which is great. Uh, that doesn't always work out. But, you know, when you have a pretty good idea – what the defense has given you and where your guys are going to be. He's just got a great knack. And, you know, to go from, like you said, warming up a few times before playing Penn State to a Heisman Trophy, it's been an unbelievable. I've never seen anything like this in one year that a program can turn around and become the offensive juggernaut that they are compared to, you know, the stodgy LSU that we used to see for so many years. You know, Travis Etienne obviously is a really good back who's been in this spot before for Clemson. But when Jack Ham and Jack does the games with me, you're, you're yep. privileged to have Gary Danielson. I'm privileged to have Jack Ham. 
he talks about Clyde Edwards Alaire, and what Jack really is impressed about him is that he's a running back who runs pass routes like a wide receiver does. How important is he to what Burrow and that offense and what they want to do? He's big time. Um, and having him, if he's going to be at full strength tonight, hopefully with a hamstring, uh, it'll make him that much more dangerous. You know, he didn't have much to do in the semifinal game, and, and rightly so, they didn't need him. Um, but, you know, from probably the beginning third of the season on, every time we did a game, uh, Gary would say to me, this kid's special, this kid's special, you know, and, and you look at all the receivers and, and they're throwing it all over the yard, and it, you kind of got lost, and it's, you know, probably because he's 5'8", and he was a three-star guy and, and all of that, um, but every game he got better, and he does run routes like, I mean, he's got over 40 catches, too, so you add those to the, you know, three, four wide receivers they've got, you get, you know, Chase, if, if you double-team Chase, Justin Jefferson's going to kill you. If you do it to Jefferson, Terrace Marshall will rip you a, a new one, you know, and, and then Thaddeus Moss, their tight end is you know, Randy's uh, kid is, I think, a really, really big threat. So uh, he's just got so many weapons, Burrow does, and, and Clyde edwards Elair is one of those and a, and a key cog. And when the running game goes, it just makes the whole thing that much more dangerous for him. What I was impressed with, because obviously you had the privilege of doing the LSU-Alabama game in Tuscaloosa, and LSU kept that margin throughout the game that kept Alabama from getting in front. Yeah. What did you think of the uh, mental response from Burrow in that offense? Because it seemed like every time Alabama would respond, he'd respond right back. Yeah, um, that was the key to the whole thing because I thought there's always that time, you know, you have a little doubt in your mind. You go, okay, uh, they, they can't win here. They can't win this game. They got the lead, and then they hit a little stagnant part in like the third quarter, and here comes Tua, you know, throwing touchdown passes, and it got tighter and tighter, and then all of a sudden it's just, you know, Joe Burrow rolls out. He looks like he's going to throw it out of bounds, and he throws an unbelievable play, and it clicks everything back into gear. And from that point on, Alabama just couldn't catch him. They didn't have enough time. You know, it, it's it's amazing. When you're scoring 50 points a game, when you go out there and you go, well, let's hold LSU to 35 and we got a chance. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> you would have never said that years ago. And, and you know, Clemson's got a great defense and they only give up 11 or 12 a game. But, man, I'm sure Brent Venables is sitting there going, let's hold these guys to 27 and hoping Etienne and Lawrence and our guys can score, you know, 30-something. So I think that's the kind of game it's going to be tonight. Yeah, I agree. I see. I've I've felt of late in the last few years the way offenses are that when you're hiring a defensive coordinator, I think what, something you're looking for in a quote new defensive coordinator is can you get me one more stop each half? Right. I think yep. that's the way offenses are today. Absolutely, and and you know, and they you know, coaches even and you know this, they say we have to we have to steal a possession, meaning we got to get a yeah. stop, we got to get a fumble, we have somebody's got to muff a punt, we got to get one more possession because we got to keep scoring points. And you know, even Nick uh, Saban, uh, you know, God knows he loves his defense, and and it, it wasn't nearly as good this year, and it maybe never will be again because I think what Clemson's done this year, it's a combination of things. The ACC is not very good, so they you know played a bunch of people that they could hold down, but. To hold people to 11 a game and, and not give up more than 23 in any game. I think Georgia did that too until the SEC championship game against LSU. So even the really premier defenses, uh, you can't expect to just, you know, 15 or less anymore. It's just kind of like, hey, if we hold them to 17 or whatever, that's the mentality anymore of defensive coordinators, no matter how smart you are and, and how much you're paid, like Venables and Dave Aranda and this one tonight, they're two of the best defensive coordinators around. And I guarantee you right now, if you told either one of those guys, um, I'm just 21, that's all, and we're going to score the rest. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd take it right now. I bet you both of those guys would. Between the difference between Aranda and Venables, you and me, besides money, is, uh, <laughs> exactly. is that yeah, a little the two separation of, the two, there, huh? <laughs> yeah, a little separation there. The dumb the, play the by the play guys don't make that kind of cash. <laughs> yeah, the two of us actually had restful nights of sleep. Those two didn't last night. <laughs> uh, I, uh, you, a couple times you referenced that's the way it, it wasn't like that at LSU before. What was like that at LSU before was they were usually great defensively, loaded with a lot of athletes on defense. Now, I know they still have a lot of athletes, but what has been the difference in LSU's defense now because the offense quote has been carrying the day? Yeah, I think it was, you know, I think it was Steve till like mid-November. I think that's the last time they got, you know, somebody really rolled some points up on them. I think, uh, 
maybe it was Ole Miss, had 600 and some yards and 35, 37 points, whatever it was. But they had guys hurt at that time. Uh, Caleb on chase on was limping around. Uh, Grant Delpit was limping around. Rashad Lawrence, I don't even know if he played in that game on the front line. And they got healthier. They got better. And I like these guys on defense. I, I know they're not the, the shutdown maybe that you've seen in the past, but uh, – Grant Delpit's, I think, one of the best players in the country. Uh, Derek Stingley and Christian Fulton, the corners, are awesome. Derek Stingley is, you love this kid, man. When you see him, and I know you've seen him play, but uh, I think he's going to be playing not only defensive back, but wide receiver next year. His ball skills are off the charts. I mean, he's unbelievable for a freshman especially. Um, But those guys, you know, they just kept getting better and better. Jacoby Stevens, you know, started the season kind of playing linebacker before he moved to safety, and, you know, we'd watch him on film and we watch him in games and I thought you know guy's yeah, a good player but he can't cover and, and then I you know every game I did he got an interception I'm like what do I know I don't know anything you know he's just built more like a linebacker than a safety I guess and then their front line is is not as deep as maybe it used to be and it doesn't have Glenn Dorsey type stars I guess but Rashad Lawrence I mentioned him he's he's just you know a 315 pound plugger Tyler Shelvin, their nose tackle, I don't think gets enough credit at all. And he's not like Quinn and Williams was at Alabama last year that went to the Jets. But, man, he can play, and, and he's right in the middle of that thing. They basically have about three nose tackles on their defensive line. They really don't have defensive end guys. They have Caleb on Chason and, and, you know, Michael Divinity's back for tonight. So those are their those are their sack guys, but they're really not defensive linemen. They're just outside linebackers. So it's a little different look, but there's a lot of talent on that side of the ball too, I think. I've only seen Stingley, obviously, on TV a couple of times. But yeah. when I look at him, I keep thinking to myself that by the time he gets to be a junior, he'll be Jeffrey Akuda of Ohio State. Oh, man. I think it, that's it, the kind of play. Yeah, he's unbelievable. Yeah. And he's had some interceptions this year where he is not only glued to a receiver. I think he had two in the SEC championship game. I can't remember because he ended up with six or seven or whatever. Um, but he, he was not only glued to the receiver, but from through the ball in a spot that I thought was going to be perfect. And he turned at the last minute. And the ball was there, and he just snatches it away from the wide receiver. I'm like, who does that? And he had, a, you know, he had one against Alabama. Every interception that we had this year with him was like, oh man, kid can play. And so, yeah, he's going to be special by the time he's a junior. When uh, when you've had the opportunity, because obviously, you know, Clemson can only do that if they're playing at Texas A&M, for example. Yeah. But to see Lawrence play, when you've at least had an opportunity to see him, what have you thought as somebody who has extensive NFL as well as college experience? Well, we're going to have the number one draft choice this year playing for LSU, and the number one draft choice next year is going to be Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, he's special, exactly, and he is huge. I mean, I thought last year when I saw him play, I thought he's kind of a tall, skinny kid, and then I saw him this summer, and uh, <laughs> I have a really good one of my best friends is a big Clemson guy, and I said, I said, hey, Trevor, we got to get a picture taken. I got to send it to my buddy, and he said, sure, and I said, you might have to bend down so we can get in the same picture. He is all of <laughs> six six, maybe more. And his legs are big, and he is put together, man. He And he's got a rocket for an arm. And I don't know if anybody played better other than Joe Burrow probably at the quarterback position the second half of the season than he did. It just got it got overshadowed, you know, to a certain degree by what Burrow did. So, I mean, Trevor's special too. And he's got, he's got weapons galore. I mean, uh, he can make all the throws. I think what he did in the semifinal game was pretty awesome with his legs. Um, and he's really done that all year. And that wasn't even supposed to be – part of the equation I don't think and uh, I saw him play once in person this year because I went to the their opener against Georgia Tech on that, that Thursday night first time I got but you mm-hmm. would have loved this first time I've gotten to tailgate since I was probably uh, 16 <laughs> years old or something so that part was that part was fun too Steve you love it wow. um, anyway I got a chance to see him play in person in that game and his legs were a big part of that game so um, both these quarterbacks have good wheels Joe Burrow's not a slouch running the ball either so it's going to be interesting You've had you've done a lot of traveling around the country during the course of your career. So now you're locked in the last couple of years into the SEC. What has it been like for you to be in it, to see the SEC on a week in and week out basis? What do you appreciate it about it now that maybe you didn't before? Yeah, you know I did. Uh, Todd and I basically were kind of in the SEC for maybe five years yeah. before that too. I mean we didn't we yeah. didn't venture out too far until it was bowl game time and and occasionally you know, switching over to yeah. an ABC game in the afternoon or whatever. So kind of been in it for a while. But um, you just it, – it's 
um, it's kind of hard to explain, and I don't want to sound like I'm a big SEC rah 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 guy, and it it just means more and all that slogan stuff. But the the fans' intensity is when I got the job. Gary said, "You're going to be under a microscope now." I said, "You mean I haven't been under the microscope for the last 35 years?" And he goes, "Yeah, but people down here are brutal, man. They'll Twitter you to death." I said, "Well, I'm not on Twitter, so I don't care what they say. I, I care. I want to represent, you know, and and do a, a great job." But yeah, you miss something down here, and and they'll rip your head off, you know. So that that's part of the passion. Um, I love that part of it. Uh, as far as the football, I, I don't think it's that. But the, the thing that I think is somewhat different is the depth in the defensive lines in the SEC, I think. At least the really good teams, they got guys that that you walk out and they go, okay, they're playing on Sunday. Um, You know, you go someplace else and there's other places you go around the country go, "Ah, that guy can probably play. He'll get bigger or whatever. Don't have to say that in the SEC. Go, that guy can play right now. So I think that's maybe the biggest difference is defensive linemen are really fast and really big and really talented uh, across the board. But, uh, no, the passion in the league is awesome. And, you know, I live in the South, so that part's fun. And I get burnt on by my friends as much as any anybody else. <laughs> I'm going to my local dive tonight, and we've got a mixture of Clemson, Georgia fans, LSU fans. They'll be screaming, you know, the Clemson and LSU guys will be screaming at each other, and I'll be ducking, you know, when they're throwing things at each other. So um, that's, that's all part of it, man. That's the best part about college football. Oh, well, you're also part of the best part of it, too. You know the high regard which I hold you. Thanks so much. It was great that you gave us even a few minutes today, Brad. I really appreciate it. And I think the same of you, my friend. Don't uh, don't be a stranger. It's, it's been a long time, so let's keep up. You got that right. Thanks so much, Brad. Appreciate it. You got it, Steve. The great Brad Nessler from CBS. He is something. <laughs> really. You know, he's, he's the kind of guy that when you're around him, he always makes time for you. Always makes time for you. So, you know, I had a lot of long talks with him over the years, only because he made time all the time. All right. Uh, we'll read the parts of the report that Alex Cord needs to be sweating bullets about in a moment on News Radio 1070 WKOK, brought to you by Purdy Insurance. Okay. This is actually from the report that was tweeted out by Jeff Passan, who's done a great job reporting on this. Uh, this Okay, because, again, A.J. Hinch fired Jeff Luno, fired Alex Cora, is in deep trouble. At the beginning of the 2017 season, employees in the Astros video replay review room began using the live game feed from the center field camera to attempt to decode and transmit opposing team sign sequences for the use when an Astros runner was on second base. Once the sign sequence was decoded, a player in the video replay, uh, replay review room would act as a runner to relay the information to the dugout, and the person in the dugout would notify the players in the dugout or signal the sign sequence of the runner on second base, who in turn would then decipher the catcher sign and signal to the batter from second base. Early in the 2017 season, Alex Cora, the Astros bench coach at the time, began to call the replay review room on the replay phone to obtain the sign information. On at least some occasions, the employees in the replay review room communicated the sign sequence information by text message, which was received uh, by Cora. Approximately two months into the 2017 season, a group of players, including Carlos Beltran, yes, the Mets manager, discussed that the team could improve on decoding opposing team signs and communicating the signs of the batter. Core arranged for a video room technician to install a monitor displaying the center field camera feed immediately outside the Astros dugout. That feed, by the way, is used for player development and was approved by Major League Baseball. Witnesses have provided largely consistent accounts on how the monitor was utilized. One or more players would watch the live feed of the center field camera on the monitor, and after decoding the sign, a player would bang a nearby trash can with a bat to communicate the upcoming pitch type to the batter. Witnesses explained that they initially experimented with communicating sign information with clapping, whistling, or yelling, but eventually they determined banging a trash can was the preferred method. You could hear it. Players occasionally also used a uh, a message gun to bang the, the uh, trash can. Uh, 
generally one or two bangs corresponded with certain off-speed pitches, while no bang corresponded to a fastball. Witnesses consistently described this new scheme as player-driven, and with the exception of Alex Cora, non-player staff, including individuals in the video replay room, had no involvement in the scheme. However, witnesses made clear that everyone to the Astros' dugout, heard or saw the banging. In addition, the players using the monitor installed near the dugout to decode the signs, employees in the Astros' replay review room continued to decode sign sequences using the monitors in the room and communicate those sequences to the dugout for use when a runner was on second base. Both methods of sign stealing were used by the team in parallel throughout the 2017 season. Yikes. Other than that, I think it went pretty well. <laughs> Even another reason why Carlos Beltran should have been suspended. Now, Hinch, well, Hinch was suspended for a year and then subsequently fired. He was against it. And it comes out in the report he was against it. The problem was, even though he broke the monitor twice, he was so mad about it, he took a bat and he, he broke the monitor twice, according to the report. But he didn't stop it. He didn't report it. And because of that, he was suspended for a full year and subsequently fired by Jim Crane, the owner. Lunau, general manager, suspended for a year, subsequently fired by the, by the owner, Jim Crane. The report makes plain in no uncertain terms. It says in no uncertain terms of the report that the owner, Crane, knew absolutely zero about it. Nothing. Red Sox fans, be braced. Your manager is in deep, deep trouble. And everybody knows I'm a lifelong Red Sox fan, believe me. I will be as critical as anybody. I'm I'm sick and tired of all this stuff. Just be good enough and win on your own. Use your own talent. I find the whole thing disgusting. It's disgusting. Matt Leon, half hour, thanks to Brad Nessler.